headlines from the week prior that caught my eye, give you my thoughts on those headlines and tell you how I think they apply to the real estate market and how understanding them can make you a better real estate investor. Let's go ahead and dive right in. I know a lot of the people that will watch this video are interested in investing outside of the United States in addition to the US. And so I wanted to quickly go over a podcast that I listen to religiously. It's called Macro Voices. And every Wednesday they have a segment or they do a particular show on the oil market. And um, I actually know the guy relatively well. I did a conference for him up in Vancouver. The uh, host name is Eric Townsend. And one of the individuals that he has on all the time is an expert on the oil industry. His name is Art Berman. He is right here. And one of the things that I heard them talking about is how the shale oil, the, the production consumes a, a lot more of the reserve a lot faster. So the reserves for the, the shale production of oil are depleted at a much faster rate than an oil, a normal reserve. So how does this apply to real estate? Well, it doesn't necessarily directly apply to real estate, but in an indirect way, it kind of does because a lot of the currencies that you could purchase through real estate. So as an example, if you buy a property in Colombia, you've got to purchase Colombian pesos in order to buy that real estate. Those currencies are affected by the price of oil. So the market right now for oil is baking in all of the reserves that are that have come online with shale but their argument was the market has not considered the fact that these shale oil reserves are depleted at a much faster rate and if the market did the price of oil would be higher therefore the value of the peso in relationship to the dollar would be much higher so i wanted to just throw that out there quickly for the first topic of discussion. Not necessarily that you need to make any drastic moves based on the information right now, but it's just food for thought. And I think it's a great example of how you need to think as a real estate investor. You can't get one dimensional. You've got to see multi dimensions, especially if you're planning on investing outside of the United States which I would strongly, strongly encourage. Just a reminder, I, what I do with my own portfolio and what I suggest to my friends and family is to have a large portion of that portfolio in the United States, in US dollars, especially if that's your home country, but take a portion of your portfolio and invest it in a market that's not denominated in US dollars. And I go into that rationale quite extensively in other videos. So we'll move on to the next topic of discussion. Okay, another forum that I'm a member of that I browse frequently, it's very, very high level content. I'd strongly suggest anyone who's interested in real estate becoming a member of the site. It's like a social networking site specifically for real estate investors. And it's called Bigger Pockets. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it, but uh, really great stuff. And I'm going to pull up a topic of discussion here that I was, or that I noticed last week. And the topic is this economy feels like 2007. Am I wrong? And um, I apologize in advance to these guys that. Uh, I don't know how to block out their name or anything, but it's it's on a public forum, so I don't think it's that big of a deal. And um, I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus here, but I just want to point out that uh, this gentleman, uh, you know, he sees the sky high valuations in the United States, and it uh, quote unquote feels like 2006, 2007. Uh, he discusses Denver uh, briefly, and then this gentleman comes in and says, uh, you know, going by feel is a bad way to judge the economy. And then he goes into his explanation as to why, 
and his uh, opinion of where the economy is and what housing prices will do. Um, but ironically enough, he uh, bases this from what I can tell strictly on uh, feel. <laughs> I don't see any charts. I don't see any graphs. I don't see any data points. Now, to be fair, he does uh, link to this, which I'm sure has a, a lot of information. But uh, uh, and I would normally go into it, but that's not really my point. I don't want to get too far off on a tangent. My point is that I see this so often where people just make a decision as to whether a market is in a quote unquote bubble based on who knows, just the, their friends, just so much anecdotal evidence. And this goes for the United States, this goes for Colombia, this goes for anywhere. And I think that especially as Americans, we are very quick to try to attach the label of bubble to anything. And I think that's because we lived through such a dramatic bubble in 2009, 2010, 2011, that now we're kind of that general who's fighting the last war or the last battle. And that every single time we see a price go up, we say, oh my gosh, it's a bubble. And you can see that, uh, that one of the gentlemen who post, uh, it was just down a little bit uh, lower, said that uh, he bought in 2012, but then he sold in 2014, 15, because he thought it was a bubble. And he's kicking himself now that he uh, sold. And then th this gentleman goes on to say that um, you, there's a much bigger risk of not being involved in the market than buying at a market top, which I would completely, completely disagree with. And here's why. If you don't just base your decision-making process on feel, and if you actually do use data and do use charts, it's not that tough. And let me go into it here. This is a chart that everyone should really get familiar with. It uh, comes from the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. And these are housing prices. And actually, I'm sorry, I think they actually source this data from uh, the Case-Shiller Index. But these are housing prices adjusted for inflation. And that is really, really important. Just because housing prices go up doesn't mean that you increase your purchasing power. If prices go up at the same pace of inflation, you might have a larger number that is attached to the value of your property. But as far as purchasing power, you haven't gained anything because the price or the prices of goods and services have gone up in the same amount. So always look at prices adjusted for inflation. And when we see this red trend line right here, and I'm going to go into another chart here momentarily that goes back this far. But I've also looked at several charts when I really started to get into real estate in 2012 and when I went kind of all in on real estate. And this trend line actually goes back into the 1800s. Very, very consistent. And you can see here that starting in about, uh, you know, the end of the 90s, we started this uptrend and then we just boom, hockey stick up to this peak let's say in 2007, and look at the gap between where the historic trend line going back to the 1800s for housing prices adjusted for inflation. Look at that gap. So anyone who looks at this, especially you know, in retrospect, says, how on earth could you not know that there was a bubble there? Then... We go all the way down here where you can see that price is almost bottomed out on this historic trend line. And when anyone asked me how, why I had so much confidence in taking a good majority of my uh, net worth and putting it into real estate in 2012, this is why. Because this, in addition to some other uh, factors that, that I found through research, but this was the main 
reason is because I thought, wow, you know, going back a hundred years, it's always come down to this trend line and then kind of gone back up. It's gone down, you know, maybe just for momentarily below it, but then it always goes back up. So I said, you know, what's your downside here? It's probably not much. And then now, of course, we're up here. Now, let's go on to this next chart where I want to make my main point. And this chart is fantastic. This is actually the one that I really got hyper-focused on in 2012. But you can see for some reason they haven't updated it recently. But in this one, you can really see that historic trend line here. And you can see that sometimes prices do go down. That was a complete misnomer before the crash is that prices never went down. Well, they didn't nominally, but they sure did in real terms. And what in real terms, that's what's most important. So you can see this trend line here. It's going back to 1970. Again, you could follow it all the way back to the 1800s. And it goes up, it goes down. It's always around this trend line. Then all of a sudden, when credit expanded and the government tried to get everyone into a house, Boom, you've got this, and then it goes all the way down to this historic trend line and then starts going back up. And now, again, we're probably up in this range. So how can you use this information to make better decisions as a real estate investor? Well, this could, just because we were right here or just because we were right here, we were still miles ahead of the historic trend line but you still had a long way to go, which is their point in this, uh, in this forum. And now, you know, we're up here, but just because we're up here, it doesn't mean that we won't go up here. And their point is that being out of the market, if you would have sold right here, then you would have missed this, all of this upside. Or if you would have bought here and sold here, like the one gentleman did that was kicking himself, well, you would have missed uh, you know, out on all this this upside. Okay. What I found most productive in my investing career, and I retired in 2012 as an entrepreneur, I knew nothing about investing. And since 2012, I've been a full time investor, mostly in real estate. And where I've done really well in real estate is when I have bought an asset when it is cheap. Now, notice, I didn't say when I bought an asset at the bottom, or I didn't say I, when I sold an asset at the top. It's when I buy an asset when it's cheap, and I sell it when it's expensive. So using me as a specific example, let's go back to this other chart. I went all in right here in 2012. Well, that just so happened to be a bottom. Now, that, that was complete luck that I just hit the bottom perfectly. But what I did know back here is that housing, relatively speaking, was cheap. Or it was at least priced at a level that, based on our historic trend line, was fair. So then... I started selling, now I do have, uh, I still do have quite a few houses in my portfolio, but I started selling a lot of those houses in 2018. So right around here. Why did I sell those houses? It wasn't because we had just eclipsed maybe the top in 2007. It was because relatively speaking, the prices were expensive. And again, that doesn't mean that the prices can't double from here or quadruple from here and I will miss out on the entire move. That is very, very possible. But the only thing I do know is that when I bought down here, prices were cheap or fair on a historic basis. And when I sold, they were expensive on a historic basis. And whenever I've done that in the, the past in my uh, investing career, I've always made a lot of money. Now, when I have gone in, when prices are expensive, thinking, well, they're going to get more expensive, I, I've lost my butt every single time. And let me be clear, just because you are buying a piece of real estate doesn't necessarily mean that that's the asset that you're buying that's cheap. 
or expensive because you're buying it in a currency. So if you're buying it for a currency play, then it could be the currency is cheap or expensive. So I don't want to get too far off on a tangent. Let's just focus on real estate right now. But there is other ways that you can buy real estate and buy the currency when it's cheap or expensive. So let's keep moving on here. The main takeaway that I wanted to really ingrain into your thought process is to look at any type of investing as blackjack. And when I was a lot younger, I was really into blackjack and counting cards and um, I, I won't go into that uh, too extensively, but it really helped me in business and it helped me in my uh, investing look at things in terms of probabilities and not in good decisions or bad decisions. So more, what I mean specifically is that when I bought here in 2012, there was a good probability that I would make money. Now, the, the market could have gone down, it could have gone down, but the probability was that I was buying at a good level. And then when I sold in 2018, the probability was that the market was expensive. So again, I could miss out on another quadrupling of the US housing market and I would be totally okay with that because I'm not trying to pick a bottom or a top. That is a fool's game. What I am trying to do is make smart decisions based on probabilities. The best example that I can give you is in blackjack. And hopefully you guys know the game well enough to where this will make sense. But for those of you who don't know the game at all, the, the goal is to try to get your cards to add up to 21. So when you get a hand that you can either stay or you can hit, buying real estate right now in the United States, with the exception of, of the, the lower end, which we'll get into in a moment, is, is similar in my mind to getting a 19 at the blackjack table and hitting on that 19, getting a two and then getting 21. So my question for you, watch, everyone watching this video, is the person that hit on 19 and got 21, did they make the right decision or the wrong decision? I would argue, and this is my whole point here, that they made the wrong decision because probability tells us that getting a two to get that 21 when you're at 19 is extremely, extremely low. The probabilities of that are just, are, are very, very low. Not zero, but very, very low. So if you do that over the long run, you are going to lose money. You're going to lose all your money. So hitting on 19 even though you got a 21 it was the wrong move and it, it sounds so simple but when we adjust our thinking in investing in real estate to blackjack to right now if i'm in the united states am i hitting on 19 that would be my question to myself am i hitting on a 19 and my answer to myself would be yes, I'm hitting on a 19. I very well could get 21, but the probability would be very, very low. And those who are trying to squeeze out a 21 by hitting on a 19, they may make money, but if they do that over the long run, they will always end up broke. And that's really the takeaway that I want everyone to kind of uh, think through here. And as far as blackjack, trust me, I will get into that in much greater detail and how understanding that game applies to real estate investing in future episodes. But for now, let's go ahead and, and keep on moving. Now what I want to do is go over an article that I, well, it's not the actual article, but a chart that explains the article on construction costs increasing dramatically in the United States. And I wanted to go over this 
right after I went over kind of the, the U.S. market and it being expensive. Because here is a counter argument to that. I'm always, uh, I, I never want to take one side. I want to always absorb all of the information. Now, I, I don't think it's a counter that could claim the U.S. market isn't expensive, but it's a way to analyze the market and maybe tell us why it's expensive and then analyze the probability of it going down. And if it goes down, what side of the market will go down first? So you can see our build costs here due to inflation have just really gone up dramatically. And I know this firsthand because back here in 2014 or so, I actually did a couple new builds in Portland, Oregon. So I know exactly what it cost me on a per square foot basis. And that was about $120 per square foot. That was excluding land and permits. And now uh, that article that I read um, said that the new construction costs are north of $150 a square foot, which absolutely makes sense. And as you can see here, really is confirmed by this chart. So why this is important for real estate investors is because if you have to go into the United States market right now and buy, you, you've got much less downside. Although the market is expensive, like I said, you know we are hitting on 19. If we absolutely have to, it's far better to go in on the low side and try to go into the Midwest, maybe the Southwest, some of those cities where you can still buy real estate for under the cost of construction. In Kansas City right now, although it's hard, you can still find 1,200 square foot homes, three bed, two bath, just your, your perfect rental property in great neighborhoods, awesome school districts, and you can still get these for right around $150,000, which as you can see is under the cost of construction. And that's really hedging your downside. It's not that the market won't crash and your equity, uh, you know, the value of that or the price of that property might go down in the future. It may, but your downside is limited because there's never, ever going to be more supply of what you have put on to the market at the price you're buying for. Let's go on to this next, on, this is the same topic here, but uh, different set of charts and here we've got just kind of uh extended you know back to 1967 we got 92 and then 2005 so it kind of zooms in as you go so you can get a better idea of uh kind of where things were and where they are today and uh you know is it any surprise that back in 1967 that uh you know, everyone says, oh, my grandma bought our house for $12,000. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's because the cost to build it was five. And what we can see what happens with inflation. And now, you know, every single headline you read is how housing is unaffordable. And, um, you know, thank you, Federal Reserve. Uh, thank you for printing uh, just trillions of currency units and keeping interest rates at zero for 10 plus years that, that's what happens and that takes me to my next topic of discussion which is not only interesting but uh frankly quite scary and for those of you who are strictly just hyper focused on real estate and don't pay any attention to macro i would um i would highly suggest starting to pay attention as much as you can and this is why negative yield quicksand risks trapping even the u.s bond market so let me explain to you here briefly believe it or not there are thir almost 13 trillion now of government bonds that have a negative yield. And uh, yes, I, I said that correctly, a negative yield, meaning that if you lend the government money, you will be paid back less money than you actually give them. So you won't even be paid interest. 
you will pay them interest. You will pay the government interest for lending them money. Now you may say, George, that makes absolutely no sense. That's completely ridiculous. And I would agree, that makes no sense. And I'm not gonna go into why there's all this negative yielding debt. That's, I will definitely get into that in future videos. But right now the point is, there is $13 trillion of negative yielding government debt sloshing around the world economy. So what does that mean for real estate investors? So when you look at all these headlines of uh, you know Vancouver housing prices being through the roof, Australia housing prices, Swedish housing prices being through the roof, United States, um, you know, well, not just Vancouver, all of Canada, um, every single headline, world headline you see right now pertaining to real estate is almost the exact same housing prices at all time highs. That is because if you're an investor that has the opportunity of buying stocks, bonds, real estate, all these different asset classes, are you going to take your money and loan it to a government that is going to give you a negative yield? That's going to take your, that's going to, where you have to pay them to lend them money? Absolutely not. So what you're going to do is you're going to take that money and you're going to throw it into real estate. So as real estate investors, we need to really pay attention to what the yield is on government debt because that is a competitor for our real estate. So as an example, if all this, uh, if, if uh, bonds, let's say, went from a negative yield up to a 5% yield, well, if you've got a rental property, it might be more attractive for you to go into bonds opposed to real estate. So that could put a lot of downward pressure on prices, especially in these markets where real estate is so inflated on a historic, uh, on a, looking back at a historical chart. So pay attention to the macro is really the takeaway here. Understand that there's tons of trillions and trillions and trillions of currency units that have been created over the last, you know, since the, the great financial crisis in 2009. And all of that money is sloshing around the system. And that money is driving up housing prices. That is definitely a tailwind right now. And this is kind of a interesting juxtaposition to what I was saying earlier about housing prices being expensive in the United States. And it doesn't mean that housing prices aren't still expensive. They absolutely are. But it does mean that there are some interesting tailwinds here for housing prices that sh we should consider. Number one, the housing, the cost of construction. And number two, all of this money sloshing around the world economy, looking for a place to go to actually get some sort of yield. And that does not mean that um, based on these considerations, you should be hitting on 19. <laughs> it just means that you should be cognizant of them. And when you're looking for opportunity, when you're looking for that next investment, all of this should go into your thinking process. So guys, that was today's show. I hope you enjoyed it and stay tuned next week, next Saturday, where I'll post another episode of the George Gammon Real Estate Investing Show. If you like this content, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and we'll see you guys next week.